live in an increasingly te te technological era, you know, with the internet, uh, smartphones, GPS, uh, other digital devices, drones uh, that affect the way that people live and interact. Um, uh, there's these extraordinary privacy issues that's, that, that have developed and they have, they have real impl uh, implications both on law enforcement and how law enforcement does its job and criminals, the, the way that criminals, um, um, you know, enterprises uh, operate uh, around the world. And they have really required judges to re-examine uh, the Fourth Amendment and the traditional doctrines of the Fourth Amendment that we're going to talk about today. And in the last several years, there have been two blockbuster decisions that uh, we'll talk about. Uh, the Jones decision that had to do with GPS and the Riley decision that had to do with the seizure of a cell phone uh, incident to, to an arrest in which the Supreme Court really for the first time uh, a number of justices raised real questions as to whether we need to re-examine uh, these Fourth Amendment doctrines. So let me introduce very quickly our panel. Uh, sitting to my left here is Laura. We, we have two incredible academics. We have Laura Donahue uh, from um, Georgetown and one of the leading scholars uh, on this. She has an article that's really, I don't know if it's been published, but it's about to be published. It's in your materials that is really the, uh, a digest on the Fourth Amendment and how the Fourth, the Fourth Amendment has developed uh, through the years. And we have Oren Kerr, uh, who is at George Washington, who was in the ju Justice Department, was in the computer crimes section, uh, is equally um, uh, well regarded, takes a slightly different tack than Laura does, um, and, and has written extensively on the Fourth Amendment. We have Nathan Judish. Uh, from, the, uh, um, from the Justice Department and the computer crime section. And Nathan really has been part of almost all of the litigation that's happened in the last decade at least uh, that has to do with Fourth Amendment issues, privacy issues, you know, cell site, cell site locator um, uh, information and other um, uh, litigation, you know, the Apple cases, the Microsoft cases, other, other litigation is, that, that has gone on. Uh, uh, we have Alex Joel uh, from uh, the, the, uh, the Office of the Director of uh, National Intelligence. And <coughs> Alex is the, is the chief, what would I call, civil liberties, privacy, and transparency officer. Has been there, I think, for about 15 years uh, and has worked very closely with someone that you all know well, Bob Litt, who was the general counsel there for, for uh, many years, is not anymore. He left at the end of the administration and can speak about uh, sort of the way in which the intelligence community is approaching pri uh, pri privacy issues. We have Jennifer Lynch here who is with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And it's a nonprofit group that um, uh, is engaged in protecting our privacy rights uh, as they relate to di digital issues, and she's been involved in lit lit litigation all over the country. And finally, we have a practitioner from New York, Josh Dr Dratel, who is um, uh, a lawyer in New York, very active in the NACDL, and really has litigated probably more than certainly anybody in this room, other than maybe Jennifer, but in real cases uh, where these issues uh, have come up. So with that, um, uh, let me begin. Uh, Laura, uh, I'm going to ask you to outline quickly, uh, or maybe not so quickly, but for, uh, for the audience, sort of the development of the Fourth Amendment since, as it relates to privacy issues since CATS. And then I'm going to ask Oren to describe, once you've gone through that, these two new uh, Supreme Court cases in the last several years, and then how that really impacts on what we're going to talk about. Okay. All right? Thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation to be here today. It's great to have an opportunity to continue to engage with my colleagues here on the panel and with all of you on these questions. Uh, so uh, Katz, is, as all of you know, in, in the case of Katz, Justice Stewart said that the Fourth Amendment protects people, not places. This was the seismic shift that we saw in Fourth Amendment law. And in the concurrence, uh, in Harlan's concurrence, we get this two-part test for an objective and a subjective expectation of privacy. Uh, Katz is now 50 years old uh, this year. 
And I'd have to say, it's not looking so good. That's going to be my take on it for today's panel. Um, the article in the CLE readings, I think I put both the original Fourth Amendment and the evolution one in there, uh, go into more detail. But the basic premise that I have is that since Katz, since, since the decision in 1967, there are a series of dichotomies that the court has introduced as a way to protect privacy. Uh, the dichotomies are the distinction between private space and the public domain, the distinction between personal information and third party data, the difference between content and non-content, and the distinction between domestic and international. And what the court has done is in the first part of each of these dichotomies, you get higher protections of privacy under the Katz doctrine, and in the latter, you get fewer. And basically what's happened in terms of technology is these dichotomies have broken down. So I'll just set the stage here for Oren for his discussion of Jones and Riley by just talking about the evolution of the doctrine uh, in these areas very, uh, very briefly. I mean, we have entire classes on this, right, at law school that go for months and months, but I will try to keep it to about five minutes. Um, all right, so just after Katz, uh, looking first at the private space versus the public uh, domain, the, the private versus public, just a terrestrial distinction that was drawn. There were a number of cases that were handed down right away that basically reinforced what came to be known as open fields doctrine. So you have a case called Air Pollution uh, Variance Board versus Western Alfalfa, which was in 1974. Uh, and in that case, an inspector could enter into somebody's property to observe plumes of smoke that were leaving the chimney. And the court said no privacy interest there. Then we have a case called Oliver versus the United States in 1984. Uh, in, uh, this was a marijuana case where somebody had marked off their property and written no trespassing. And the court said, well, no, in fact, uh, if you grow marijuana on a field adjacent to your home, you don't actually have any expectation of privacy uh, in that particular area. Now, Marshall and Brennan and Stevens all dissented in this case, saying that they didn't believe that you couldn't have an expectation of privacy in a public domain. Nevertheless, the court doubled down again a couple years later in a case called U.S. v. Dunn in 1987. Uh, in this case, there were 198 acres, there were multiple fences, there were locked gates, and the court considered whether an area adjacent to a barn situated miles from any road was <coughs> actually had an expect there was an expectation of privacy there, and again, the court said no. Uh, now, what's interesting is that case in particular took this concept of curtilage, which has come to be central to Fourth Amendment doctrine, and altered the meaning from how it had traditionally been understood. So if you go back to the founding, the understanding of curtilage was a field. Like if you look at Cunningham's dictionary in 1764, it meant a yard or a field. In Johnson and Walters in 1828, it meant a garden. Uh, but in this case, in Dunn, um, and as well as in Oliver, the previous case, they narrowed the concept of curtilage so that now we understand it to be a couple of feet around the outside of a home. Uh, before that, it was actually open fields was included in it. Uh, a couple of years later in, in California versus Greenwood, we have another case where somebody puts their garbage out at the curb and the court says you have no expectation of privacy and what you expose to others in public. Um, so that's the public versus private distinction for open fields. When aerial surveillance comes along, this <coughs> distinction holds. So the first case is California versus Serralo in 1986, where there's a six-foot fence around a property in Santa Clara, California, and then an inside 10-foot fence around a marijuana, uh, marijuana garden, shall we say, uh, in California. So the police in that case hired a Cessna 150 from San Jose Airport, flew it over the property, and the court, when confronted by this, said there, you have no expectation of privacy in your own backyard, even though there was a six-foot high fence and a 10-foot high fence behind which the marijuana was being grown. Uh, Chief Justice Berger in that case wrote that even these fences might not shield the marijuana, the plants, from the gaze of passersby sitting on top of a truck or a double-decker bus. Uh, now this was, a, a, this, this was an extraordinary decision, not least because I looked it up. So I'm from Santa Clara, California. I was there in the 1980s. There were no double-decker buses. Um, in fact, there was a double-decker bus enthusiast association in the United States. I looked it up. Uh, there were six buses in the entire country that were mostly oddities that people would come and look at and say, oh, look at that double-decker bus, right? There were two in Los Angeles. There was one in New York. Uh, one in Chicago, another city had gotten rid of there, so no double-decker buses. Um, and in fact, it was illegal to sit on top of a, of a truck. There were three statutes in California 
that made it illegal to sit on top of a truck at the time. Uh, nevertheless, the court said, look, anybody could sit on top of a truck and see it, so you have no expectation of privacy in your own backyard. Uh, Blackman's dissent in that case is a very uh, fun reading. He said this is bad physics as well as bad law in this day to, to tie terrestrial uh, kind of uh, terrestrial uh, trespass to concepts of privacy. Katz had promised us that it would follow with the individual, but in fact, the court just doubled down and said, if you're not physically intruding, you have no expectation of privacy. So then uh, the same day, actually the next day, Dow Chemical was handed down when the court considered an aircraft flown over uh, an industrial plant. And the court again said, no expectation of privacy. So then when somebody hired a helicopter in a case called Florida versus Riley in 1989 and hovered 400 feet above a green greenhouse where three sides were enclosed and one panel was missing and looked into a greenhouse, again to find the proverbial marijuana, it's always marijuana, right, in Fourth Amendment cases. My students always make note of this, <laughs> that it's marijuana. Um, in this case, again, the court said you have no expectation of privacy. So leaving, so, so that's the aerial, that's where we are in terms of aerial surveillance, and then RFID chips come along. So the court again looks at this, and the first case is a case called U.S. vs. Knots in 1983. Uh, and what happened in this case, a, a, a chip was placed on a container that was put in a car and then tracked through public space. Then that container entered into a home. And the court said, look, as long as that car is in public space, you have no expectation of privacy. But when that container with the chip enters into a home, now it's a different story. Now you have an expectation of privacy. Uh, the court in that case uh, was uh, careful to hearken back to some previous cases where there was uh, the observation was made that cars do not have, you know, that you can't keep secret when you drive around in a car where you are. Now, the respondent in that case noted that by the, by the nature of the court's decision, then 24-hour surveillance would be okay. It would be fine. And the court protested. They said, no, in fact, if that were ever to be the case, the Supreme Court would reconsider it and expectations of privacy would be reevaluated. Uh, that has still not happen. So in U.S. First Cairo 1984 followed the Knotts case. Once again, in this case, it was ether, which apparently is used to extract cocaine from clothes. Um, who knew? There was an ether container. They put an RFID chip in it, and they tracked it. And again, the court said no expectation of privacy. So for the public-private distinction, the test is, or the, the understanding is really a two-part understanding that the court has. Uh, first is when you leave your home, you assume the risk that what you say and do can be seen and heard by others. That's the court's basic take on this. And the second part of this is, and it's not fair to disadvantage law enforcement, to force them to close their eyes or cover their ears so that they can't observe what anybody else could otherwise observe. And so with this rationale, the Fourth Amendment actually has continued to be tied very closely to the terrestrial domain. Uh, so we move then into third party information uh, versus personal data versus third party information. This is the second dichotomy. Here, the court actually in Katz, Justice White was clear, very clear. He said, informant doctrine is in no way influenced by this decision. Well, informant doctrine had evolved at that time from a case called On Lee versus U.S. This was 1952. Then we had Lopez in 1963 and Hoffa in 1966. These cases basically said that if somebody comes even into your home and you tell them something, the fact that they have entered into your home, you allowed them into your home. Therefore, if, if they are recording you, if they repeat what you say, if they're wearing a mic and somebody else hears what you say, you have no privacy interest because you have entrusted that information to somebody else. Well, Justice White and Katz reiterated that this was unchanged, and sure enough, immediately afterwards, there was a case called White versus United States. And in that case, it was informant doctrine again. The court said, no, we uphold this informant doctrine. And so when Smith comes along, Smith versus Maryland in 1979, in this case, there was a woman who was assaulted in Baltimore, and she saw this car, a 1975 Monte Carlo, right in front of her when she was being assaulted. She got home and somebody called her on the phone, identified himself as her assailant, and told her to come out on her porch. When she did so in 1975, Monte Carlo drove really slowly in front of her. So she called the police who were in the neighborhood. They saw the car, they ran the plates, and they saw that it belonged to Michael Lee Smith. So the police approached the phone company, which if you'll remember at that time, phone calls weren't determined by the, uh, you weren't billed by the number you called, you were just billed by the number of domestic minutes versus international minutes. And they had this really cool device, a pen register, trap and trace. No phone companies had this. Phone companies didn't track phone calls at the time, the numbers that you dialed. 
that they said to the phone company, may we put this on your line? The company said yes, they attached it, and the PRTT recorded that Michael Lee Smith was calling Patricia McDonough. So they used, the, they used that information to get a warrant to go into his home, and there they found a telephone book turned down to Patricia McDonough's name, and they used the money to convict, or the, the information to convict him. Uh, at trial, Michael Lee Smith said, I have a privacy information in the number that I dial, and the court said no, you have given that information up to somebody else, just as in an informant case, you've given that information up to somebody else, therefore you have no reasonable expectation of privacy. The dissent in that case again said, you, there is no reason to believe you don't have an expectation of privacy because a lot of information can be ascertained by who you call. Now remember, this is before cell phones, before they followed you 24-7, et cetera, but the decision in that case, and in a subsequent case, Miller versus United States dealing with bank records, really spawned third-party doctrine, which is what we now have that marks this field. And I'll just leave it um, right. there and move to the, the final two, content versus non-content. And we'll pick up on this, I think, later in the email discussion and text discussions, but the court has also relied on a distinction between content and non-content as a way to pursue the distinctions of what is a reasonable expectation versus not. But unfortunately, what we're seeing with technology, just as in these other areas, is increasing challenges to this, where things traditionally that might be considered content are non-content, uh, like metadata that's associated with all of your activities that yields tremendous insight into your behavior patterns, what you do, where you go, and who you're with when you do it. Uh, it, it also has taken non-content and given that tremendous uh, depth. And finally, domestic versus international, the last dichotomy. The court has drawn a line at the border of the United States. A seminal case on this is Verdugo Urquidez, where Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, came forward and said, you have a different expectation of privacy when overseas. There is no warrant requirement uh, for overseas collection. Uh, this might have made sense in a non-digital world, but again, in a world where all of our communications fly overseas literally at the speed of light, and we have no control over where that information goes. The idea that you would have a lowered expectation of privacy simply because of how global communications and the internet works is really an extraordinary claim. Uh, so I'll leave it there as a So Warren, for can Warren. you just tell us um, you know, how the Supreme Court recently has raised issues about these traditional concepts? Sure, so um, I think my job is to talk about two cases, United States versus Jones and the Riley case. Uh, Jones is from 2012. Uh, I'm, probably you're familiar with the facts. This is the case in which the government uh, monitored uh, the location of a car using a GPS device installed on the car for 28 days. Uh, the question was whether this was a search or a seizure, either in the installation of the GPS device uh, or of the monitoring. Uh, and there were three opinions in the Jones case, all of them odd and unexpected. If you just sort of looked at Fourth Amendment law beforehand and tried to figure out what the answer might be, none of the three opinions in the case gave you that, that answer. So uh, the five justice majority opinion, the opinion of the court by Justice Scalia, uh, says we're not going to answer the reasonable expectations of privacy question. Instead, we're going to say that installing the GPS device was a trespass onto the property of a car. Uh, and that a Fourth Amendment search is not just a violation of a reasonable expectation of privacy, but also independently a trespass, something that is a trespass alone, constitutes a search of the car. Uh, so the five justice majority just punts on the reasonable expectation of privacy question and says installing the GPS device was a search. Uh, doesn't necessarily require a warrant, that wasn't answered in the Jones case, but installing the device was a trespass onto the car. Why exactly was it a trespass? We don't know. Justice Scalia just keeps repeating that it was trespassery. There's a word you should add uh, into regular speech. Uh, so that's the five justice majority. And then there were two concurring opinions, uh, one by Justice Sotomayor, who had joined the five justice majority opinion. Uh, she uh, suggested a very different approach uh, to the Katz test, uh, in which the test should basically be, does the government, has the government obtained a way of figuring out lots of personal information about people, their sexual habits, their personal habits, their political views, and so on, and that once the government obtains that much information and collects that much information and analyzes that much information about somebody, then it should be deemed a search. Uh, so this is, this is something I've called the mosaic theory, because uh, that was what the, the DC circuit below had suggested uh, the thinking was, and that is you, instead of looking at whether you, um, individual government acts or a search, you kind of look at a whole and say, okay, did what the government did collectively over a period of time 
give them so much information about somebody that it's almost like they had uh, entered their home, or the kind of body of knowledge you'd expect someone to know if they had entered somebody's home. Uh, and so that was the, the suggestion of Justice Sotomayor, just one justice, but an intriguing opinion. Uh, justice Alito concurred on behalf of four more justices. Uh, most of Alito's <coughs> concurring opinion is criticizing Justice Scalia's trespass view, basically criticizing Scalia for Scalia's suggestion that this trespass theory had always been part of the Fourth Amendment, and, and you know, Alito goes through the cases and says, no, that's not right. Uh, and then at the end of Alito's opinion, he says, uh, he, he suggests a very different uh, approach to the reasonable expectation of privacy test. He basically says, would a person have expected the police to investigate a case like this? Wow, getting 28 days of location information through a GPS device in a narcotics case, that's pretty unexpected. Um, yeah, a couple days of monitoring people would have expected, but 28 days of monitoring, that goes too far. Uh, and so at some point, a search occurred uh, because the monitoring went on for too long. I think also reflecting a mosaic-like idea that you look kind of at the collective whole uh, of what the government did and what the government uh, analyzed instead of at individual discrete acts to see whether they're searches. Um, but Alito, I think, also had a different spin on it kind of based on um, public perceptions about what law enforcement would do. Um, I don't know where the public gets its opinions about what law enforcement does other than like watching Law and Order. So maybe <laughs> Fourth Amendment rights hinge on the, the next Law and Order episode. I don't know. Um, but What's unusual about Jones is that the really, the, the majority opinion is this trespass idea which just punts on reasonable expectations of privacy. Uh, Scalia has a paragraph suggesting he probably disagrees with uh, the concurring views but doesn't go into any detail. Uh, and then we've got five justices totally uh, 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 applying the CATS test in very unusual ways but not in a majority opinion. So, so there's sort of hints of things to come uh, revolutions to come maybe in another case, but they're in concurring opinions, not in the majority opinion. Uh, Riley versus California is, I think, more clearly, that's the blockbuster case uh, from 2014. You're probably familiar with the basic facts. Two different consolidated cases, one involving searching a flip phone, the other searching a smartphone. Uh, the question in what being whether the search incident to arrest doctrine allowed a warrantless search of a cell phone uh, which of course is a technique that a lot of police officers had started using. Everybody starts carrying cell phones and under the United States versus Robinson case from 1973, the Supreme Court had said, bright line rule, the government can always search property on a person when they're arrested. In that case, it was a crumpled cigarette package, the officer opens it up, finds heroin inside. The Supreme Court says, we're not gonna look case by case at whether a search incident to arrest is reasonable, we just need a bright line rule. Okay, you can do it because search incidents to arrest, not that big a deal on a person, it's gonna be a pretty narrow search. Well, you get to Riley and the Supreme Court, nine to nothing, uh, has a bright line rule, but the opposite bright line rule. The court says uh, cell phone searches and implicitly all computer searches are just inherently different from a search of physical evidence. There's so much more evidence stored on a cell phone than would be stored on a person. Uh, there's lots and lots of personal information, uh, could be text messages, could be photographs, could be location, and you know, all sorts of private stuff is stored on that phone. Uh, and it was, uh, everyone had agreed that it was a search of the phone to access the information stored on a device in a person's pocket. Uh, but the question was whether it was reasonable to search the phone without a warrant. And the Supreme Court says, bright line rule the other way for electronic storage devices. Uh, uh, that is uh, a presumptive warrant requirement incident to arrest for electronic devices. So we have now a physical, uh, a physical evidence rule, the government can search it without a warrant incident to arrest, and then a digital evidence rule, which is the government can't ordinarily search incident to arrest without uh, a warrant, uh, any electronic storage devices. So when you take Jones and Riley together, you think, okay, there's some really interesting things happening here. Uh, Riley, most importantly, suggests that digital is different, at least in some cases. There's sort of what I think of as possible future Riley moments where courts will say, we've got this old doctrine based on physical facts and now we have digital facts and the facts are so different that the implications of a ruling, of sticking with the physical ruling, are, are just very different. You think about ultimately the reasonableness test for um, uh, reasonable searches and seizures, uh, usually premise on some notion of um, uh, the, the degree to which the search is gonna invade privacy interests and advance law enforcement interests how broadly that search will be, what are the potentials for abuse and the like. And that's just, just gonna be very different if you're comparing searching a piece of paper 
versus searching a cell phone that might have basically a library's worth of personal information or a laptop which might have several libraries worth of personal information. So I think what prompts uh, uh, the panel and a lot of uh, litigation ongoing now is this idea that if computers are different, if searches of computers raise new issues, um, what are those differences? What are the doctrines which have to change? Presumably it doesn't mean that all of Fourth Amendment law can be forgotten and we just start from scratch and just create new rules. Uh, it doesn't mean that, but it also doesn't mean we mechanically apply old rules for a paper era to the electronic world. We have to uh, make some adjustments to that. And, and I think the history of Fourth Amendment law, including the cases that Laura very expertly uh, went through, are, are about the courts kind of recognizing new technologies and, and, and adjusting rules in response to those new technologies. Things like, you know, so many Fourth Amendment cases are about automobiles, uh, car searches, car stops, uh, car searches, impounding cars, you name it. Um, in the 1920s, that was, those were the computers, right? Those were the new technologies. And the court spent a lot of time trying to figure out how should the Fourth Amendment apply to car searches and car seizures. Uh, and so I think the uh, computers are going to be to the 21st century Fourth Amendment what uh, cars were to the 20th century Fourth Amendment.